Good morning and welcome. I'm Robert Summercrest, Dean of the Terry College of Business, and I'm glad to see you're here for the November edition of Terry Third Thursday. I think this is one of the most important ways, one of the best ways that we've been able to keep a dialogue going with the Atlanta business community, and uh, it's wonderful to see such a good turnout today. If uh, you're one of the people attending for the first time, uh, I'd like to also welcome you to our Terry Executive Education Center, the, the TEAK here in Atlanta. This is a home base for us for a variety of programs that we run. Um, we started with our executive, education, our executive MBA program uh, a little over three years ago, and now we've expanded to a couple formats of an executive MBA as well as some non-credit executive education and some, some other types of programs. Uh, uh, we have some things that have been growing recently, like our Certified Financial Planner, our Director's College. Uh, last week, the American Marketing Association was here for five days with a, an advanced school of marketing research. So we're using this facility in a variety of ways and really um, uh, running up to its capacity. Uh, before I go any further, I want to thank some of the people that are sponsors of this event, our uh, premier corporate sponsor is Bank of North Georgia. So can I get uh, Elizabeth Livengood and Andy Williams to stand if they're with us? Uh, Deloitte is also one of our corporate sponsors, and I just had a chance to meet Ed Hayes. Ed's a member of our alumni board and deputy managing partner of Deloitte's uh, Atlanta office. Ed, could you stand? We have two media sponsors uh, from the Atlanta Business Chronicle, Cheryl McDonald and Shelley Lewis, I believe, are with us. And from Atlanta Public Broadcasting, uh, we've got uh, President and CEO Milton Clipper, along with Harriet Hoskins Aberhall. So welcome and thank you. Um, I certainly appreciate all the sponsors that we have for our programs and specifically for Terry Third Thursday. This morning is the last Terry Third Thursday of the calendar year. We always take a break for the holidays, but we've got a, a nice schedule of uh, programs lined up for you for the beginning of 2008. Uh, we start off on January 17th with James Langford. Uh, James is project executive in charge of revitalization of Jekyll Island for Linger Longer Communities. And most of you probably know that's the company that created Reynolds Plantation and Lake Oconee. Uh, in February, uh, Doug Ben, he's the executive vice president and CFO of Rare Hospitality Incorporated. Um, that's the company that owns and operates franchises for over 300 restaurants, with most of those being uh, Longhorn Steakhouse and Capitol Grill restaurants. Uh, Rare Hospitality is in the middle of a $1.4 billion acquisition of Darden restaurants, and uh, we're glad to have Doug here. He's a, a double dog, being a, a bachelor's and a master's of accounting graduate. In March, March 20th, we have Julio Ramirez. He'll be here. He's executive VP for Global Operations of Burger King Corporation. You can register for any of these programs on our website or just see some of the alumni relations staff we've got, we've got with us today. A um, couple other uh, Terry alumni happenings that I want to mention before we go into our program. Uh, immediately after Terry Third Thursday, we have uh, something new. Uh, we have a young alumni board that will have its first uh, official meeting. They've been uh, organizing this for a while. Uh, I think this is a really important new initiative for us that has been spearheaded by our alumni board of directors, and it's my hope that this board will be a way of getting the voice of the younger alumni uh, throughout the state and perhaps elsewhere into the Terry College. Uh, I think it'll be a good way for us to help strengthen the social networking among our alumni. It'll develop some of these uh, younger people into true leaders and uh, perhaps have future roles for them in the college and help with their careers. And finally, I hope it's a, a way to get a rallying point for some of the uh, support that we're trying to establish for the Terry College among the business community. Uh, young alumni, uh, our potential young alumni board members are people who graduated from their undergraduate within the past 12 years, and we hook each one of them up with a, a mentor from what we're now calling, I guess, the senior alumni board. Uh, I know we've got several of you with us uh, in the room. Could I ask the young alumni board members to please stand?
Jay O'Meara will be the first chairman of the Young Alumni Board. And, Jay, I want to thank you for the leadership that you're showing for this organization. We have uh, a lot to be thankful for, and I know it's in, in good hands. Uh, second alum, uh, alumni activity I wanted to mention is our Risk Management Insurance Alumni Reception. Uh, that's going to be on December 13th, and it'll be right here at the Teak, the Terry Executive Education Center. It's a great chance for risk management uh, alumni from the Atlanta area to meet each other as well as to meet some business contacts. And for those of you who know Sandra Gustafson, and I think uh, that would include probably anyone who graduated from that program, this may be the last chance for you to see her in her official role with the Terry College. Uh, Dr. Gustafson has announced her retirement plans effective January 1st. She's been uh, a, a faculty member in that department. She served as the uh, head of the Insurance, Legal Studies, and Real Estate Department for 13 years, and most recently she's been Associate Dean for the past seven years. So uh, if you're uh, interested in that reception, please let someone in our alumni office know. I want to turn things over now to Richard Quartz. He's been absent for a couple of months, and I'm glad to see you back. Uh, Richard is a graduate of the Terry College, and he's vice president of Carter right here in Atlanta. Uh, he's a member of our alumni board, and he's been serving in that capacity since 2002. Richard, can I ask you to introduce our speaker? Uh, thank you, Dean. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning, uh, Jim Lentz. Jim is the uh, Chief Operating Officer for the State Government of Georgia. Um, he's the first person to hold this title and was appointed to that position by Governor Sonny Perdue in 2003. <clears throat> Prior to uh, this um, position, Jim was a partner and chairman of Traveritas Group. I hope I pronounced that correctly, a, a financial services firm he helped uh, co-found. Um, additionally, Jim is well known as his uh, his position at president as president of the Mid South uh, Division of Bank of America. Um, Jim's been a career banker. He spent most of his career with uh, CNS and before that Nations Bank and now Bank of America, but won't get into all that. Um, he's got two degrees, one from that uh, trade school down on North Avenue and the other from Georgia State. He completed the uh, advanced management program at Harvard. Jim served as chairman of uh, the Georgia Chamber of Commerce in 1998, uh, the Metro Atlanta Chamber in 2000. <clears throat> he is a trustee of... Georgia Tech Foundation, Rhodes College, the Lovett School, the Georgia Research Alliance, and the Carter Center. But uh, enough about uh, that. We're here to hear Jim and talk about Georgia, and welcome you to Terry. Thank, thank you, Richard. I, I appreciate that. I'm glad to be with you guys this morning. Um, I want to compliment the dean on this facility. Uh, I was telling him we have used it for some of our executive education for, for the state, something I'm going to mention in just a few minutes, and it's a magnificent facility, and Atlanta's lucky to have it, and uh, you guys are lucky to, to have it here in Atlanta, so that's, that's terrific. Um, I thought what I would do this morning, and uh, if I understand your format, uh, I'm going to talk for maybe maybe 20 minutes and then I'll leave whatever time you would like to take for, for any questions that you have. That's typically the, the most interesting part as far as I'm concerned and probably as far as you're concerned also. But I thought I'd talk a few minutes about uh, some of the things that, that I have uh, learned the last five years. I want to talk a little bit about uh, some history, some modern history, and then just briefly about some past history of our state. And then I want to tell you some of the things that we believe that we have, uh, have accomplished the last five years in our state government that, frankly, we talk about a lot, but it's not something that the, the media is all that interested in. Uh, so we do whatever we can to get our story out, and that's one of the reasons I'm here this morning. So let me begin by just talking about some of the lessons and things that I've learned uh, the last few years. The first is that, uh, that public service is exciting, and it's uh, rewarding. I would commend it to you. I happen to be somebody who had the opportunity to serve in this kind of environment toward the end of, of my career. Uh, many of you will have the opportunity perhaps toward the front end or in the middle of it, but I certainly would suggest that, uh, that you, given the opportunity, uh, take it up because it's been stimulating and interesting and exciting for me. Uh, the second thing I've learned is that running a, a large state is a big job. 
Georgia is the ninth largest state. Uh, being governor or CEO of a state like Georgia, I would argue is probably uh, probably the most difficult elected job in U.S. politics, short of being president of the United States. If you think about it, we have a twenty billion dollar budget. We have about one hundred and thirty five, hundred and forty thousand employees, and the governor of, of a state like Georgia has to deal with issues, and I see this on a momentary basis, that, that are issues like education, transportation, health care, water, uh, air, economic development, uh, Medicaid, or I mentioned health care, but, but he's constantly in and out of very, I'd say, challenging conversations and moves from one to the other with a great degree of, 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 on his part, ability, but it's just a tough job, and I guess I knew it was a tough job, but I certainly did not realize the complexity of that job before I, I had a chance to witness it the way I have the last few years. I've learned that Georgia constitutionally has a very powerful governor or CEO. Uh, that governor sets the revenue estimate for our state to which we budget. Uh, you know, the, the media has a good time every year, and I, I understand that, with all the bills that are introduced in the legislature, all the debate that we have. But the single most significant bill that is passed every single session is our budget bill. That's what drives the state. It sets the agenda. It sets the policy. And you should be thankful, as I am, with all due respect to the, our 236 legislators, that the governor sets the revenue estimate to which they budget. We would not want them to set the revenue estimate. They have a lot of ideas about how to spend money. And happily, uh, that's done, and we have a constitutional requirement for a balanced budget also. But the governor sets the revenue estimate. He proposes the budget. And then he has a line item veto. You remember some of the conversation last spring about the line item veto. He exercised that, had a lot of ink in his pen last year, and uh, really didn't feel like some of the things that were in the budget at the, the final analysis were appropriate. So he has the ability to go in without vetoing the whole bill and line item things that he doesn't believe are appropriate. I just contrast the powerful governor in Georgia to for instance, South Carolina. Uh, Mark Sanford, the governor of South Carolina, is a good personal friend of mine. He's a great guy. We do a lot of things together. You may have read about our recent port announcement down in Savannah about a joint port with the state of South Carolina. But the, the governor, with all due respect in South Carolina, is kind of like a king. They have no ability to uh, to set the, the, the budget. There's a budget control board over there. The governor proposes a budget. The, control board proposes one. The legislature almost always votes on the control board's budget. Uh, then they routinely in South Carolina uh, save two days at the end of their legislative session to override all the vetoes that the governor has made of their bills, uh, which we hope nobody here figures that out. <clears throat> but uh, they do that. So it's just a little bit of a different environment. And the reason I tell you that is it's real important who we elect as our governor. So remember that in three years. Think about it in subsequent years. The individual who is in that seat has an awful lot of power and an awful lot of influence over your life and my life and the lives of our families and all Georgians. It's been affirmed to me the, uh, the brilliance of our founding fathers as they separated powers of executive, legislative, and judicial. I I'd never paid much attention to that. Perhaps you have, maybe some of you have. I never thought much about it, but seeing it up close and personal, the separation of powers, the contention that exists between the executive and the legislative branches, and oftentimes the judicial branch also, is something that um, has taught me an awful lot. None of us would want to live in a state or a country without those separation of powers, I don't believe. Uh, so that, that was a brilliant move uh, 200 plus years ago, and it, it is pointed out to me almost on a daily basis. I can only imagine that um, if we think about the contention that we see here and the tussle that we see between the three branches of government, it's times probably a million in D.C. as we think about and watch the things that happen there. So that's, that's been affirmed to me. I've learned uh, the hard way that the organization structure in our state is, is quite vertical. The governor is responsible for everything. Uh, I've done a, a reasonable effort and hopefully a reasonable job in staying out of the media. That's not what I want to do. I don't want to be elected anything. I don't want to run for anything. I have no interest in that. Uh, but I've made some decisions that have gotten the governor in trouble. 
I did most of those early. I've learned. Uh, I'm a slow learner, but I finally figured it out. But we have a very vertical organization structure. And a lot of things that you read, the governor did this, or the governor did that. It's not always the governor. It's it's always the governor's responsibility, but it's not always his decision, although this guy likes to make decisions, and I, I appreciate that and understand that. I have learned uh, <clears throat> just how fortunate we are to be living in a, a growing, prosperous state. Um, a lot of our states aren't growing like Georgia. Georgia's the third fastest growing state of the nation, percentage-wise, behind Nevada and, and Arizona. Uh, we're now the ninth largest state. I think I mentioned that. Um, that creates issues when we're growing at 100,000 plus or 150,000 people a year. It creates issues that we have to deal with, issues in education, issues in transportation. But I would much rather be in a state having to deal with issues of, of growth and prosperity than I would in a state dealing with shrinking uh, economic bases and shrinking population bases. And finally, um, I've learned that it's been energizing and, and fascinating, as I mentioned, being a part of, of history. And let me mention to you some of that history. I served with the first Republican governor in Georgia in 130 years. I believe you remember that when he was elected in 2002. The two previous Republicans in, in Georgia, most recent was a, a gentleman named Benjamin Conley, Governor Benjamin Conley. He served out three months of the unexpired term of Governor Rufus Bullock, who was a appointed or elected or however ha that happened in 1868. If you think about the time frame, the, the war was just over down here. So Rufus Bullock was a Republican governor of Georgia. Governor Bullock was, after three years and a few months, was removed from office for selling pardons, bribing the press, and ransacking our prisons. So <laughs> Governor Conley was able to finish out his term. Uh, governor Bullock was from New York State. Governor Conley was from New Jersey. So I'm not sure about, I guess they were Republicans. What I do know is that I work for the first ever reelected Republican governor in the history of Georgia, the 274 year history of our state. And this is the first individual to ever serve as a reelected Republican governor. I work in the, an environment for the first time where the governor, the lieutenant governor, and t both branches of our, our legislature and our secretary of state are all Republicans. Uh, that's pretty symmetrical. Um, I'm not sure if that's good or bad. You can make that conclusion yourself. Uh, I do know the first couple of years we had a Democratic House, and at least we knew what color jerseys each other had on. Uh, now we're not so sure. You have to watch. You get clipped every now and then. Uh, so you have to be careful about that. Uh, but, but it's a historical time, and it's been interesting to be part of that. This administration uh, came in five years ago with an ambition to change the culture in our state government. Pretty heady ambition. Uh, Governor Purdue wanted to make government more responsive. He wanted to make it more principle-centered, results-oriented, and customer-focused, uh, not necessarily words that had been used in state government before. He really wants more than anything to leave it better than we found it, to be perfectly candid. Uh, and I think that would be regardless of how you think we found it, and it wasn't. It certainly wasn't broken dramatically, uh, but there were a lot of improvements that needed to be made, and the ambition is to leave it better than it was found. Uh, let me give you a little current history. When we came into uh, office in 2003, the state was suffering its first back-to-back -back revenue declines uh, in modern times, actually since the, the Great Depression. Uh, we had reserves of about $400 million in, in January of 2003 uh, when we came into office. Uh, most of that was programmed into our fiscal year 04 budget, which began in Ju June, July, I beg your pardon, <coughs> of 03. Um, just to put that in perspective, uh, $50 million is about one day's reserves. So we came in with an eight day reserve uh, and as I said, appropriately, that had been programmed into the 2004 fiscal year budget. The states, uh, Georgia is one of the seven AAA states in the nation. That's a great thing to have. No governor wants to lose the AAA. Uh, it helps us borrow less uh, expensively, as, as you all know. Uh, but we didn't want to lose it, but I would have to say it, it was at risk because of our revenue situation and because of our reserve situation. Along the way, in, in kind of that environment, uh, 
in the spring of 2003, I was in a meeting with, with Governor Perdue, and uh, we had talked about some aspirations we could have. And one of the things we had come up with is that Georgia should become one of the best managed states in the nation by the year 2007. Uh, so we went in, and, and while we had written this down, I'm not really sure. I tell this story, and it's, it's a true story, uh, but I don't know exactly why we wrote it down. But we had written down on a piece of paper, Georgia should have the aspiration to become one of the best managed states in the nation by the year 2007. Don't know why we picked 2007, uh, but we did. And we went in and talked to the governor about it. And I remember it. he reached in his pocket, pulled out his pen, and scratched through one of the. He said, why would anybody want to be one of the best of anything? Our aspiration should be to become the best managed state in the nation by the year 2007. That was pretty audacious, uh, crazy at the time. And what I remember thinking the most is, well, I'm only going to be here two years, so it really doesn't make any difference. <laughs> And here, here we are, and here we are in 2007. The really good news is that we didn't declare whether we'd accomplish this objective in January or December of 2007. So we have a little time left to go, and I'll get back and talk about that in just a minute. Also in that environment, that time frame, we couldn't get the state's audit out in less than 15 or 18 months. Uh, that's not good, Ed, is it? Uh, I'm not sure what the public standard is these days. I, I, it used to be 90 days. I think it's less than that, some large companies. But our audit was taken in excess of a year to get out. Uh, our construction projects, and we have a lot of those, and, and most of them, in fact, virtually all of them are appropriate. But I joked at the time they were all late, but they were over budget. Uh, it's pretty amazing to look at all of those. Medicaid is a huge driver in our budget, and Medicaid costs the curve was about 11 to 12 percent increase every year. And this is one of my favorites. Some um, you may remember the 30 minutes are free situation with our driver's license. Uh, Governor Barnes had done this. I actually think it's a pretty good strategy at the time. We were having trouble. The state was having trouble uh, with their driver's license, and so he came up with a policy that said if, if you don't get it in 30 minutes, it's free. We were giving away between 12 and 1500 per week of driver's license um, at $15 a copy. That's what a driver's license cost back then. And so you can do the math on that. It was costing our taxpayers a fair amount of money because we were as inefficient or as ineffective as we were there. Um, about the same time in the spring of 2003, the Commission for a New Georgia came along. The Commission for a New Georgia was an idea the governor had that is this commission's made up of a, a number of uh, senior business executives, business leaders in Georgia. Uh, they came together, supported by task forces uh, and pro bono consultants, and I'll tip my hat to Ed Hayes and his group at Deloitte. They, they served as our consultants on a recent task force, uh, did an excellent job for us. Un limited amount of resources that had been contributed to the state by significant consultants, the McKenzie's, the Deloitte's. I mean, just really the, the premier names have done really great jobs for us, and we, we are forever grateful about that. But we asked this group of business leaders to come in and help us identify some things we could do better, things we could do more effective, more efficient, uh, things we could improve upon, improve upon. And we agreed to do one thing in return we agreed to implement what they suggested insofar as possible. Now, i got to tell you, that's a creative thought. A lot of you guys have been in environments, I was, where consultant studies ended up where? They ended up on your coffee table in your office. They ended up in your credenza. Uh, it always drove me crazy when somebody, when Bain came in and did a study, and we looked at it and said, this is really nice, and we wrote them a big check, and we put it in the credenza, and we didn't implement as aggressively as we could or should have, perhaps. So we said, no coffee table books. We will do the best job we can to implement your recommendations. Not going to promise you we'll implement all of them, but we'll promise you we'll do the best we can with those we can implement. And I believe we've done that <clears throat> very, very well and very aggressively. So um, how does the culture get changed? Uh, that's, that's always an interesting question to me. I think the best way you can make that happen is everybody needs to be involved in some way. The CEO has to be involved. This governor is involved. He's very engaged, very involved in our cultural change. We talk about it on a regular basis. You have to define the new culture. And I mentioned 
principle-centered, results-oriented, and customer-focused. We also defined a culture that would be uh, founded on communication, accountability, and teamwork. Now, these things were present, but they weren't prevalent in the state government at the time, and it's something we talk about on a regular basis. We're focused on service delivery, faster, friendlier, and easier. Uh, service delivery and state government is typically not found in the same book, leave alone the same paragraph or the same sentence. And we really have focused on that. We really have uh, made some progress there. All of our agencies have customer service champions. They meet together on a regular basis. They talk about things we can improve. We have uh, little banners and uh, coasters and things with faster, friendlier, or easier in virtually all of our buildings. If you walk through the Capitol, you'll see banners that say faster, friendlier, and easier. We most recently, about two weeks ago, had the state's first ever customer service recognition event. It was really a neat day. We recognized about a dozen individuals, and we recognized four teams. We recognized one agency, and we very we had an outside group that, that chose our winners. They were individuals were nominated. We had 400 nominations for 10 spots, uh, and the people who came in were from Chick-fil-A and uh, Delta and a couple of other places, outside groups that came in and looked at uh, our, our nominations and chose the, the winners for us, helped choose them, and uh, they were blown away by some of the things we've accomplished. So I really think that's a big cultural change for us. I mentioned earlier, I want to get back to this, the driver services, and I'm sure many of you might have had this experience over the past few years. Our overall transaction time, that is kind of wait time, peaked in uh, <clears throat> July of 05 at 22 minutes and 34 seconds. That's from the time you walk in the facility. And that doesn't sound too bad, but that's all across the state. We have about 30 driver services, 35 I think it is, driver services centers throughout the state. Um, but it was the average time was 22 minutes and 34 seconds. Today, that same time on a comparable basis is 6 minutes and 38 seconds. But that doesn't tell the real story. We had some centers in, in congested urban metropolitan areas. Our North Cobb Center, the average wait time was 1 hour 36 minutes and 42 seconds. And that's now down to 5 minutes and 32 seconds. In Cartersville, our wait time in July of 05 was uh, 1 hour, 1 minute and 46 seconds. That's now 8 minutes and 10 seconds. And the one that rang the bell was up in Cumming. In Cumming, our, our average wait time was 1 hour, 42 minutes and 40 seconds. And that's down to 14 minutes and 10 seconds. So we have a lot of work to do there. And we met, but the point is we measure it. We compete. The driver services centers compete against each other on a monthly basis for wait times and other metrics that they have. And that's been a lot of fun to see that improvement made as significantly as it has been. The 30 minutes of free I mentioned, uh, we gave away at the peak about 1,500 per week. Our low points, one per week. We've never had a week we didn't give away one. I keep telling Greg Dozier, who's our commissioner there, let's have a week when we don't give away any. We've gotten down to one. We average about eight or ten. Again, you can do that math, uh, the savings in 1510 times $15, uh, or now the driver's license is actually $20. Uh, so you can do the math and see how much money you as a, a, a taxpayer might be saving there. Um, the, the thing that's so uh, impressive to me is when you start talking about improvements, they begin to take hold and people get excited about them. In our Environmental Protection Division, without any prompting from us, they looked at things they could do better to improve processes and, and times. Uh, it took them five years ago, it took them about 700 days to issue an air permit. That's more than a year, as a matter of fact. It's almost two years. Uh, that's now down to 100 days. The fee's been reduced. At the same time, we've reduced that time as dramatically have we, as we have. They issued buffer permits, stream permits. Uh, that was taken about 120 days four or five years ago. That's now down to less than 60 days, and they have a goal of getting that down to 30 days. So we are um, measuring things. We're managing things, and I think that brings about a culture change. We've also begun to think about a number of our, our functions as enterprise-wide. And think about a large organization, perhaps like some of you, you work in, you, you see enterprise-wide functions, things like accounting, things like uh, uh, procurement, uh, technology, uh, human resources, property management. Most of those functionalities were embedded in our, our agencies, very vertical 
organizations. But we've defined those five and a couple of others uh, that are now enterprise-wide functions. We've brought in very qualified individuals to, to run those, and we think about them on an enterprise-wide basis. Gives us a chance to look at our technology enterprise-wide. Gives us a chance to, uh, to get our audit out. We hired our first state accounting officer. I think controller. We had a $20 billion company with no controller. Uh, and he and his staff were the ones that are now responsible for getting the audit out uh, on time. We've done that the last two years. We'll accomplish it again this year. Our standard we set is six months. Our year ends June 30th. So the last two years we've gotten our audit out prior to, to calendar year end, and we will accomplish that this year. I really think we'll accomplish it in early December this year, which is a little bit of a record for us. Our AAA uh, is, is solid, no question. We meet with the rating agencies on a, a regular basis. Tommy Hills, our chief financial officer, does. Uh, our reserves, are, which, remember, were about $50 million, are now $1.8 billion. Uh, that's still slightly in excess of 30 days reserves, <clears throat> and some of them are used for educational true-ups in the, the mid-year. So they'll end up uh, probably in January, February, be about a billion and a half or about a 30-day reserve. But that's, uh, that's better than 50 million. It's also, in my opinion, I'm pretty physically conservative. Uh, that's only 30 days. I don't think any of you would want to run your business or if you could keep from it your household with 30 days supply of cash on hand. So it's not like we have reserves coming out of our ears. We have a billion five and that's, that's about right in my opinion. We hired the first, uh, state property officer Georgia has ever had. Uh, one of the things we found when we got there was we had no inventory of our real estate. We didn't know how many buildings that we owned, where they were, what they were worth. We didn't know what our leases were. We didn't know when they came due. And that, you know, that's a big deal because if we had three or four offices in Gainesville, let's say we had a driver services, a, a, a family and children's service office, and a Department of Labor office all in Gainesville, and they were – their leases were coming due, they had no ability to know that each other's leases were coming due. So they were negotiating separate leases with separate uh, landlords, and that's expensive. Now we have the ability to bring all that together as we know leases mature. But we have defined, we have a wonderful website. I don't remember the, the site name or I'd tell it to you. I'd be happy to do that sometime. But where we can go in county by county, identify what real estate the state owns, uh, what it leases, the terms of the lease and the conditions. That's really uh, a neat thing. Also under our state property officer, uh, the last two and a half years, 100% of our construction projects have been on time and on budget. And that, this is one of my favorite things because we really put pressure on the construction managers. As some of you might be construction managers, you know there's some pressure on a construction manager. And we said we really think it's important that you bring these projects in on time and on budget. And somebody, individual, came to me during part of that process and said, uh, you know, these people are worried about their jobs. And I said, good. <laughs> Isn't that neat? I mean, I worried about my job for 35 years. Aren't you worried about your job? I worried about how I could do it better. I worried about how I could improve it. I worried about how I could work with other people to make things better. And all the things that, that all of us, I think, do in the private sector on a daily basis. So we focus their attention a little bit, and they've, They've actually delivered ex excellent results for us, and we appreciate that. We have um, defined an enterprise-wide procurement function. We hired a gentleman named Brad Douglas uh, who has 15, 20 years private sector experience, mostly in procurement activities, and he's come in and, and helped us a tremendous amount in defining how we procure things and what we do. Uh, we have about a $6 billion spend annually on stuff. Most of that stuff we really need. I'm not, I wouldn't debate whether we need it or not, but I would um, say that we didn't have modern procurement <clears throat> processes. Uh, Brad is busy and has done a good job installing that. We had a, McKinsey came in and did a study for us, one of these pro bono studies. We hired a firm, A.T. Kearney, to come in and help us with our procurement transformation. And it's, it's our ambition to take minimum 5% a year off of that six billion dollars so that's three hundred million dollars that's uh, that's a good thing for the taxpayers we're uh, installing a fleet management system uh, we didn't know how many vehicles the state owned uh, where they were who was driving them what the mileage was on them 
We knew about the same thing about our vehicles we did about our property. But now we know where they are. We know how many we have. We have 19,550, I believe it is. Uh, I don't know if that's too many, but until you know how many you have, you can't really know whether you've got too many or too few. <clears throat> so we now know what the mileage is. Unfortunately, we know that on at least 10,000 of those, the mileage is in excess of 100,000 miles. Uh, we really shouldn't have state patrol people chasing you down I-85 or 316 at 100 miles an hour on a car that's got 130,000 miles on it. But we have some of that, so we need to, uh, to work on that. But we now have the information with which to make the decisions. And then my personal hot button um, is that it all starts with people. Uh, we developed the Governor's Leadership Institute, uh, thanks to Peter and some of his associates. Uh, we've had, as I mentioned, a couple of, uh, of uh, our sessions in this building. Uh, we've trained literally hundreds of our middle managers with Stephen Covey, some of their training and the, the principles that they have. We have trained now about 250 of our top leaders in the Governor's Executive Leadership Program, which is what I referred to that we held here, um, and thanks to the help of the Vincent Institute and <clears throat> people at, at UGA have done a great job with that. Um, and we've been able to begin to talk about succession planning, talk about talent identification, talk about who our high potentials are, how we keep them in this organization. Because they're, like most companies, we're going to lose 25, 30 percent of our workforce over the next uh, five to six years, just the aging of people like you and me, and me mostly, um, and we need to know who's going to replace those people. We need to know who's going to come in next, and we, we didn't have any idea. We've recruited, I believe, exceptional leadership to come in and help us, and we hadn't done this uh, in, in a big deal fashion. Uh, when I first got there, I had a meeting of my direct reports. Uh, at the time, I had about 40. I now have about 26, I believe it is. Um, and the, I noticed that they were introducing themselves to each other. I found that kind of strange since they all kind of worked in the same environment. But they just had no teamwork. They had no communication, I mentioned. And, and uh, over the last four years, 25 of those 26 people that meet together now regularly uh, are new. And we didn't have a purge. We didn't announce we're going to fire everybody because we didn't do that. Some people left because they, uh, they wanted to leave. Some could retire. Some left for other opportunities. All the things that happened. And I would argue that we have brought in really exceptional people to, uh, to replace them. Some have come in from the private sector. Some have come in from other public sector jobs in other locations. Some have been internal hires or people who, who had done an excellent job and deserved an opportunity <clears throat> to become a commissioner and to move up to that level of responsibility. So uh, I think that's one of the things we really are the most proud of is the people we've been able to bring in. The only individual who's still in his role who was there in January of, of 2003 is Vernon Keenan, who is the executive director of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, a real pro. As a matter of fact, Vernon is able to retire, and we've asked him to hang around at least through go and Purdue's administration. And he, he's, I tell him every once in a while, you know, Vernon, I remember January of 03, we gathered in that room, and the only guy who's still there is you. I don't know what that says, but I'm glad you're still here. And that's kind of back to something I learned, and that is that uh, we have excellent people at virtually all levels of state government. They're not always well-led, and therefore they don't always do what you would want them to do or what I would want them to do. But like uh, some of you, perhaps, I had maybe an image of what a bureaucrat's like, and I, I had this thought process about how they didn't work very hard. But I was absolutely wrong, and I give them great credit for that. These people work hard. I have a pretty good work ethic. When I get into work, uh, I already got a lot of emails and voicemails. When I leave at night, there's still people trying to get in touch with me. Uh, it's a 24-7 job for a lot of these people, and they do it very well, and you should feel good about that. Now, we need to continuously improve that, just like you do in your companies. <clears throat> but we do have exceptional people working for the state of Georgia. I've learned that uh, people like a challenge. This audacious aspiration of becoming the best managed state has been good for us. You know, we don't get to uh, – we don't uh, announce quarterly earnings. And those of you who are in that environment, know how that is. I remember very well how that focuses your attention. Every 90 days you got to stand up and tell people how you're doing. And that's not always fun and it creates some uh, things that you do that aren't always uh, the best things for you to do. But we kind of had an environment where you make it through administrations. Okay, we got a new governor. He's, he or she has a lot of ideas and 
you know, we're going to just will endure for four more years. Well, this, this aspiration to become the best managed state, to have customer service metrics that we measure, to implement change, has been something that has really energized people. And I think that's, I knew that, but it's been fun to watch it in this environment. So today, uh, teamwork and communication, I would argue, are quite good, bordering on excellent. I'm certainly not perfect, but it's quite good. Individuals who have worked together for more than 20 years uh, and didn't even know each other in the past are now working together for the benefit of the citizens of our state. Uh, we stress and enforce accountability and measurement on a regular basis. We use performance data to drive our decisions. The guy I work for is a data-driven manager. I appreciate that. Uh, anytime, you may have read, there was a great article about a week ago in the Wall Street Journal about Mitt Romney, and this isn't about the presidential campaign at all, but it really fascinated me because he, he's a consultant uh, out of Bain. He's a data-driven guy, and the article reinforced that. It said he wouldn't make any decisions at all without data. I don't think I've ever seen Governor Perdue make a decision without data. If you go in without anything uh, uh, quantitative, then you're wasting your time. If you go in and try to talk him into an emotional or qualitative kind of decision, you'll go with your tail between your legs and you're sent out to come back and bring me the data. I thought that was kind of neat. The other thing, by the way, I thought was neat about the, the Romney article, if you happen to see it, is he kind of mused that how broken he thought the organization in the federal government might be and he said how in the world can you have an organization with the CEO being the President of the United States having 35 direct reports doesn't even have a CEO, COO, somebody in between him so perhaps if he gets elected we'll see that happen up there so we'll continue to make facts based decisions uh, and I'm I'm confident back to the, this audacious aspiration for Georgia to become the best managed state um, let me tell you how that works every couple of years the government performance project is done this year the Pew Center for the states I believe it is is gathering data on various states the last time it was measured Georgia was a B or B minus state that would have been in 05 the improvements we have made since then um, I'm going to be personally very disappointed if we don't achieve an A last time there were two A states Virginia and Utah and if we move from a B minus to an A, then we're going to declare ourselves the best managed state. <laughs> because I think we've deserved it. I think we've earned it. I really do. And we'll probably get some help externally to, to validate that. But anyway, we have a, we feel pretty good about that. We'll see. Stay tuned for that. That will come in the, the first quarter of, of calendar 08 coming up in three or four months. And we'll see how that turns out. But we are working to make positive changes in Georgia to make a positive difference to all Georgians and to leave things better than we found them, which has been our aspiration all along. So thanks for letting me talk to you a few minutes this morning. If we have time, Richard, I'm happy to take questions anybody has about anything. So thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. I heard about that. It rained last night, did it? <laughs> have some comments to make about are we going to face a permanent water shortage or is it, or is it just a, a temporary uh, passing thing with the water issue? The, the question Ernie is asking is about the, uh, the water shortage. Um, you know, this has been coming a long time. I mean, we've been in a lawsuit with Alabama and Florida for, for many years. I don't really know how long. Um, and, and frankly, when Governor Perdue was elected, he felt like we had Republican governors in, in Georgia, Florida, and Alabama for the first time, I guess, ever, in, in modern history anyway, with his election. And he felt like that three Republicans could sit down and work it out. And unfortunately, that hadn't worked the way it should have worked, uh, or could have worked, potentially. Um, you know, there are a lot of aspects to this. The fact that we had not had any rain is, is the biggest one. The fact that uh, the Corps of Engineers basically takes the the stopper out of the bathtub, Lake Lanier, and it doesn't make any difference how much water goes in there as long as it runs out as fast as you put it in. It's, the level's not going to go up. Um, probably, arguably, the fact that, that Atlanta's had the growth that it's had uh, and North Georgia's had the growth that it's, it's had uh, has contributed to that, and, and Atlanta has the Chattahoochee River as its only water source. You know, there are no rivers that flow into Georgia. All of our rivers start here and flow into the ocean or into the Gulf or wherever they end up. Um, I think we're making progress. Um, 
I think what I would tell you, and this is this is Jim, this is not official policy, I'll tell you that. Um, this is not necessarily about water. From Alabama's perspective, uh, it's about economic development. Uh, many of us remember when Birmingham and Atlanta were the same size, and Atlanta blew past Birmingham and became the capital of the southeastern United States. Uh, there's still some lingering, I guess, resentment might be too strong, but there, there's some issues about that in, in Alabama. Um, we know that, and I probably do the same thing, we know that in talking to economic development prospects uh, they, that we're both competing for, perhaps uh, Alabama has said, well, you know, they're running out of water in North Georgia. You probably don't want to locate there. You'd probably be better off locating here. So there are those little tangential things. Uh, I really don't understand the muscles. I just have to tell you, I don't understand that. But that's Florida's thing. One of the things we've learned out of this <laughs> is that, and I really don't understand. It. I'm not a scientist. I, I'm sure they need a little water, but gee whiz. I mean, <laughs> if it's me or the muscles, I guarantee you who I'm for. You guys are the muscles. Um, one of the things we've learned is back to something I said, and that is that Georgia has a very powerful executive branch and a very powerful governor because the governors in other states will agree to something and then they'll go back and basically their environmental protection people will do something else. That won't happen here. I can assure you when the governor makes a decision, his environmental protection people do what he suggests that should be done, and they're part of the process, part of the decision making. So it's a little bit different environment. But I, I think it'll work itself out. Prayer service Monday worked. We had some rain last night, and we need to keep on doing that. So. Yes, ma'am. You've talked a lot about the successes you've had so far. Do you have any specific different priorities going forward? Well, we, we absolutely do. These are, they're all a, a work in progress, I would say. Um, we continue to implement uh, suggestions and recommendations by some of our task forces. We continue to find things that we, we need to do ourselves. One of our big projects currently is how do we deal with our technology? Uh, our technology is very distributed to all of our organizations. Uh, we have too many data centers. Uh, they're not under any level of standards necessarily. Um, so we currently have a, a huge project underway, <coughs> excuse me, as to how we should deal with the state's technology effort, uh, whether we should centralize a lot of that, uh, whether we should outsource it or not, it's just we, we don't know. We don't have any preconceived notions. But that's, that's one of our bigger projects right now that you can, you can watch for and, and stay tuned about. Uh, and there are any number of things. I mentioned the transportation initiative. Uh, we have a new commissioner of the Department of Transportation, as you've seen. I think the governor is very focused on trying to deliver on time and, and uh, more projects and, and more transportation projects. So the short answer is there are a number of things that are in front of us, and this is a continuous process. We, we're never going to finish it. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, wouldn't anticipate we'll finish in this administration, and so that's why the next governor is important. We need to have somebody who will continue on with the thoughtful things we're doing. So just remember that in three years, please. Yes, sir, David. Yeah, I don't know that the next governor, David, will have a, a COO. I would hope so. I don't. It's got nothing to do with me, but I don't know how it got done in the past, frankly. If you assume that some of what I'm doing is important and it wasn't getting done in the past, uh, I don't know how in the world you could ever run an organization this size without a, a chief operating officer role or, or a similar kind of a role. Um, so I'm a political appointee. I would hope that the next governor would do the same thing. Um, I think the challenges are that we don't backslide. The challenges are this: there's a lot of uh, probably inertia. There's a lot of momentum to go back the way it used to be. Uh, sometimes uh, one of the things that we've, we've found, and we've thrown an awful lot of change at, at our, our employees, an awful lot. And, and we all know how that works. I mean, the only person who likes change as a wet baby, and we all know that. I mean, I came out of an environment in the banking area where there was change, 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 and it, it wears you out. So we've had people begin to come to us and say, when can we go back to the way it used to be? And the answer is, you can't. It's never. 
You can't do that. But that's the momentum. So I would say the biggest challenge to my successor is to try to maintain the, the momentum to keep the pressure on to keep change going. Yes, sir. Dr. Mr. Lentz, thanks for all your great work. Uh, question about Grady Memorial Hospital. It's a world-class provider of health care, but it can't pay its bills. And there are rumors that it's going to be uh, declaring bankruptcy. What would you do if, or what advice would you provide to Grady and its board? Uh, I would advise Grady to change the governance structure. And I believe that when that happens, that you'll see an, uh, an outpouring of financial assistance uh, and financial arrangements that will give the new board an opportunity to uh, to run the hospital on a, a more prudent financial basis. Um, I don't think anything will happen until that occurs. <clears throat> I would hope that uh, the current board would make that decision. Uh, it's coming up fairly quickly. I'm not sure exactly when, but they have the opportunity to make that decision. It's been recommended to them by everybody they've asked about it. They've, they've been responsible, and they've asked, what should we do? And 100 percent of the answers from a lot of different sources have been, you need to change the governance structure. What you have won't work. It's too political. It's antiquated. We've had other hospitals in the state that had that kind of structure, and when they change, they've been more successful. So that's what needs to happen, and I think when that happens, you'll see a significant improvement. Yes, sir. I was just curious. I want to commend you on your success of the port in Savannah and things that are mm -hmm. going on there. Thank you. And uh, as we look at the hard feel and the situation there, potential for revenue and just the pot potential for guidance, is the state playing a part in the future of Hartsfield or the possibility of developing another regional airport? Because it truly is an airport for the state. Right. And uh, its <clears throat> impact is across the state. Yeah, that's a good question. And, you know, regularly the – Somebody in the legislature suggests that the state should control Hartsville. It's a city asset. The city runs it. Uh, that's the way it's structured right now. That's, that's the way it's structured in, in really most locations, is my understanding, although the, uh, uh, in, in New York the Port Authority runs the airports of Newark and uh, Kennedy and LaGuardia. Um, right now it's a city asset. I, I don't, wouldn't suggest that it's up to me how that might work, but it's a huge economic driver. If you take Hartsville and the port down in Savannah and ports in Savannah and Brunswick, you've got two of the more significant economic drivers in our state, and they need to be handled responsibly and appropriately, and they need to be planned for the future. So I can't predict anything, but, but I do think that Hartsville is that kind of an asset. Just, just an aside, we do a study, uh, uh, frankly, with the help of the business school at Georgia every, I think it's every two years, on, on the the port down in Savannah, and we just completed that in the springtime, and <clears throat> you may know this, but, but the port contributes to basically 7% of the state gross product. That's a big deal. 7% of our employment in the state is, is driven by the port, the port facilities. That's, that's a huge economic driver. I've never seen a study, a similar study from Hartsfield, but my guess would be it'd be at least that, if not, not more. So it's a huge driver. Richard, I, I'll quit when you tell me to. Or you, you, I mean, I, I just I don't want to keep anybody that. Jim, just, there are a lot of uh, colleges in the state, and I know the board of regents. Thirty-five. <laughs> I know the board of regents is pretty independent. Is there any study that uh, has ever been done to see whether all these colleges we have are efficient? Do we need them all? Uh, it seems that all the colleges are now are universities. They used right. to, and that uh, I'm not too sure what that means, but. Uh, Seems like we have an awful lot of colleges and degrees and everything that cost the state a lot of money. Well, we not only have 35 uh, higher education units, colleges, and universities, we have at least that many technical schools that offer two year certificates. So we have a lot of emphasis on higher education, which is good. Um, I guess the short answer would be that for the first time in the history of the state, uh, we have a, a chancellor who is a, has a business background. Errol Davis is a businessman, was CEO of a, a large company up in Wisconsin. He's a terrific guy. He's a workaholic. Uh, he, he's doing things that have, frankly, needed to have been accomplished there. He's looking at ways to uh, consolidate 
back office functionality in many ways. We don't need, if we have 35 colleges and universities, we don't need 35 human resources systems, 35 financial systems, 35 accounting systems, 35 procurement systems. I mean, we all intuitively know that in the, from the business sector, but that's the way they've been run, and there's good reason for that. It is what it has been. But I think that uh, he's doing an excellent job in bringing business principles to the university system. Whether we need 34, 35, I really don't know. I think we have nine two-year schools, uh, two-year colleges, seven or nine, I don't remember exactly, but in that range. And uh, I guess, you know, part of the question is how do those, how do you organize those? Uh, are they, should you have nine, should you have 12, I don't know. But he's taken a real close look at that. We have, the governor has tremendous confidence in, in Errol Davis, our chancellor. So I think you'll see a lot of more business focused decisions get made there. One more question. All right, one more. And yes, sir. Up on the education, possibly. Um, with the uh, diminishing role of the state government as far as the support for the colleges and the universities around the state, as that percentage shrinks of, of their total financial budget. Is there any uh, discussion at the state level about um, you know, the governance of the, un the university system, the college system at the state of Georgia? Uh, does guess, it, ne does I, it need a, to be reformed to give it more control of itself? Right. Um, the, the question is, is there, uh, is there any conversation about the governance of our, our university system? Um, the state contributes about two and a half billion dollars total to, I believe that number is, to the, the universities. And then some of them create their own research and they all have tuition uh, that is approved by, by the regents. I think the last time I looked, the state contributes uh, in the 35 to 40 percent range of the total funding. I'm, I'm not certain about that number, but I believe it's pretty close to that. I know at Georgia Tech, I know we're basically a third, a third, a third, a third state funding, a third research, and a third uh, tuition. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think it would be hard if somebody, if you have one donor who's contributing a third of your, your resources, I think it would be hard to say that they don't have a significant role in how you run and how you, how you function. Uh, Y'all, you probably know the state of Virginia has basically privatized uh, some of their university system. There's some other states that have done that. I don't anticipate that happening here. I would anticipate, uh, that there might be more independence for those that generate more of their resources. Some of our 35 colleges and universities generate 5 percent. Some of them generate up to, as I say, a third or 60 percent, 60, you know, if you combine research in there. So <clears throat> I, I, I would suggest that as long as the state's the significant contributor that it is, that they'll continue to be a, an active state role there. If, if it ever got, if the University of Georgia said, look, we can contribute 90, 100 percent of our resources, and I'm sure the state would take a different look. But as long as they're getting the amount they are, I would suggest the state will have a role. Thank you very much. Okay. Sure. Jim, I want to thank you on behalf of the Terry College of Business and its uh, faculty, staff, and students for sharing some of your business savvy and what you've brought to the state. And I want to present you with this uh, glass sculpture by local artist uh, Paul Benzunas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You. Remember to either get your parking ticket validated here or just mention Terry Third Thursday on your way out of the parking garage. Thanks for coming, and I uh, hope to see you next, uh, well, in January. <laughs>